I'd like to now welcome Dr. Claire Wade, Chair of Computational Biology and Animal Genetics at the School of Life and Environmental Sciences, the University of Sydney, to the stage. All right, Hi, welcome. Everyone. Thank you, and thank you to Embark and to the other sponsors for inviting me along. It's wonderful to be here. Yes, absolutely. And it's a testament to your commitment. You're coming to us live all the way from Australia. We're at 7.30 a.m. on Wednesday morning. That's true. I'm coming from the future. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, well, thank you again for being here. Um, I'm really excited to share your background with the audience. Um, Dr. Wade completed her undergraduate and postgraduate education at the University of New South Wales in the field of animal science and genetics. After working as an academic in the School of Veterinary Science at the University of Queensland, Dr. Wade made the leap from quantitative genetics to genomics in 2002 when she accepted a position with the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The genomics group at the Whitehead later became one of the founding groups of what is now the Broad Institute. Dr. Wade worked on several mammalian genome, genome projects, including the mouse, dog, and horse. In 2009, Dr. Wade returned to Australia as a professor at the University of Sydney. In recent years, Dr. Wade's canine focus has included key roles in the analysis leading to the canine genome sequence, the development of three canine gene mapping arrays, as well as mapping of several genes for canine diseases. Projects currently underway are towards a better understanding of the genomics of behavior, including finding genes underlying canine separation anxiety and working dog performance. Today, Dr. Wade will present working with the dog community to improve canine health and welfare. Thank you again for being here. Oh, you're most welcome. Well, hi everyone. I hope that um, it's a bit of a change of pace from the last speaker, but hopefully I won't leave you all in the dust. I'm going to talk to you today about a few projects that are actually underway in my lab. These are ones that are not yet published, so you're going to see them hot off the press. And um, hopefully you'll, you'll see the sorts of things that we do and the sorts of things that fascinate me in my um, daily work. I, I feel incredibly privileged to get to I, I always feel like when I was growing up, I always loved dogs and horses, and I feel incre incredibly privileged every day to get to, to work in a field with animals that I love. And um, I'm an avid, uh, I, uh, as I perform with dogs, well, I don't perform with dogs, but I, I do dog performance events in my private life as well, and it's, it's just wonderful to have this opportunity. Okay, so I'm going to talk about three main projects. Um, the first one is a more recent one that I've become involved with. It's a diversity project uh, that's looking at how to better understand Doberman genetics, and that is in collaboration with the Doberman Diversity Project. And I'll just show you a few snippets of what we've accomplished so far there. Then I'll tell you a little bit about um, our first foray into looking at uh, what makes a good livestock herding dog. So. We're interested, a lot of these things are complex conditions that they're not Mendelian traits. It's not a recessive thing where mum is a carrier, dad is a carrier, and you get a recessive coming out in the progeny. It's not that way. We're working with lots of traits that all work together in different ways and getting a, a, a perfect combination of them is quite, uh, is quite tricky. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about a disease project uh, that we're working on with racing greyhound veterinarians. And so in Australia, certain of the greyhounds seem to be prone to an eye disorder. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we've been doing in that space. So late last year, I was contacted by Dr. Sophie Liu, who I believe might be online. And um, she had access to a large uh, data resource of uh, Dobermans that had uh, Embark canine, uh, high density canine genotyping array data. And so with that, uh, the wonderful thing about the Embark data are that the user has access to the raw data for their animals. Now, most people wouldn't know what to do with that, but as a breed uh, group, you can collect those data together and you can do some quite good things with them. And so what the Doberman Diversity Project has done has 
uh, is that they have collected together uh, more than 3,200 um, sets of data from different Dobermans across the world. And uh, these have a large number of markers for each dog. So there are other diversity um, commercial enterprises out there that provide uh, a, a set of markers that's not as comprehensive as this. But the, these animals each have are measured at 220,000 different places in the genome. And this is wonderful because it gives us a really good idea of what's going on. Those samples are de-identified, so we don't know precisely who each dog is or where they live, but they come from all over the world. And if we analyse those uh, individual data and collect them across the different uh, dogs, then we can actually uh, get some summary statistics for them for each marker. And so what this little plot here, I know it just looks like blue and orange wiggly lines, but what it does is it shows us, it, it lays out each marker in order on the dog's DNA. And so we can see precisely in the DNA what's going on in terms of the breed diversity. And so the blue line represents where the um, alleles where the different variants at each marker are close to fixation. So the higher that line goes, the less variety or the less diversity there is at that site in the genome. And with the orange uh, one, it's the opposite of that. So it's talking about a thing that we call the minor allele frequency. And so when that line goes down, that means that um, all of the alleles in those dogs uh, are not very variable at all. And so you can see that there are a few I've put a red line in there at a place that um, sort of marks where the top 5% of um, problem areas might be. And you can see at the beginning of that chart that there are two big um, peaks. Um, I will say generally compared with charts that I've seen like this in other breeds, this is a fairly low diversity chart. But you can see that there's still um, total fixation would be the blue line hitting the top. And you can see that it, there are not many places in the genome where it gets above 80%. So the, there are a few, but you can see it's not all over Red Rover for the Doberman breed. There's still plenty there to work with. And it's just a question of how do we leverage that? But had we only used 30 markers or so, that wouldn't even be enough to look at one marker on each chromosome. So with 220,000 markers, we get a really nice, fine-grained, comprehensive look at what's going on. Now, another thing we can do is we can look at it on an individual dog basis. And so if we plot our dogs on a chart that shows us how like they are to each other, and we just take the first two, these are called components of variation. So we can plot these out as a different X and Y coordinate. And what we end up with is if we have dogs that are similar, they'll be near one another. And if we have dogs that are different, they'll be far from one another. So you can see with the Dobermans, we get this kind of Z, Z plot. Um, and what that kind of reveals is, I guess, uh, the history of movement of the breed in a way, where the this, this sort of smears between the blobs uh, represent um, animals that are in transition between those those two uh, populations. And so we can also ask, well, what do these populations represent? And we can look and we can see if we have a few dogs, um, we can look at that last diversity chart and we can pick out the dogs that have the rarer versions of the haplotypes or the rarer versions of the alleles in the problematic areas of that chart. So we had a problem on chromosome three. And so here, if we there were those two peaks on chromosome three and so if we paint on here the dogs that had the unusual uh, variants on chromosome three we can see here that they all sort of cluster in the same area of the chart and this is really interesting um, oftentimes in genetics we presume that the places where the rare things pop up are probably the ancestral places but that's not necessarily the case it could be something else and so let's have a look and see what might be there So 
So we were able to get a hold of a few dogs that were willing to share who they were with us. And when we add those dogs onto our chart, that allows us to identify um, roughly what those populations are. And so the different colours here on my screen, it's a little bit small. Hopefully on yours, it's a little bit bigger. But in different colours, we can um, colour the areas of the chart according to where the dogs come from. And so we can see that the left portion of the chart are European dogs, the right portion of the chart are uh, mainly from the USA. And the lower circled area there were animals from the USA, but they were not part of the standard pedigree population. And so this is a little bit interesting. What might they be? And so someone suggested um, that, um, that these might be a special group of dogs. I guess the, the first thing I, I, I nearly forgot to say, but it's very important to say, is there are a lot of people out there who are chasing rare haplotypes for the heck of it. And I think that we need to be very careful about that because breeders have been selecting dogs for health for a long time. And sometimes the haplotypes that are rare, it's well known that recessive disorders hide Recessive disorders that don't have tests hide in populations for a long time. And it's possible that these areas of low diversity actually represent areas where there has been strong selection against a, a problematic recessive trait. And so what we'll need to do is to look more carefully and ensure that those rare, before we start going crazy and bringing all those rare haplotypes back into the population, first we need to check whether they're good rare, which means that they're just rare because they're rare, or if they're bad rare, which means they might harbour an important uh, deleterious uh, gene that might be extremely problematic if we were to, um, without thought, uh, explode that uh, frequency of that rare allele. So it's really important that we don't just chase rare for rare sake we need to check carefully to make sure we're bringing something good um, but there are tools out there that can help us to do this so in the dog world there are uh, lots of dog genetics resources online that we can use to help us figure out if this is a good thing or a bad thing and in failing that those tell us the answer we can always generate our own data to tell us that Okay, so uh, one of the rarer things in Dobermans that has been selected against is a coat colour, which is white. And um, so it was suggested to me that the Doberman lines that had the white gene in them had been sort of outside of the main breeding group in the USA. And so we wanted to check to see if those might be the ones in that area of the chart. And in fact, when we looked, we could see that the gene, the dogs that had, we could see which dogs had the white um, haplotype with our white variants because we can see all the DNA and we know where the variant is. So we can look and we know that those are the white dogs. And so we can see that actually, yes, that's uh, an area of the chart where those white dogs are. Um, the fact that a lot of the rarer variants were clustering in that area might suggest that those dogs are not uh, one hundred percent Doberman, and that might be why they're getting these rarer haplotypes pop up as well. It might be that there's a bit of other breed mingled in there. We don't know yet. These are all things to find out. But what this tells us that even uh, de-identified samples can help us to better understand our population dynamics. There's lots of different things we can do. This project's just started at the end of last year. We'll, I ha uh, we have a new PhD student who'll be picking it up this year. And um, we, need to, we need to always be aware that diversity for its own sake, um, we need to be a little bit careful because there are dangers lurking there that we need to monitor. And uh, we shouldn't just be chasing rare haplotypes for the heck of it. So um, the other thing to know is that there's a lot of uh, great public resources out there now that we can use to help us. Okay, so next, um, uh, popping onto a completely different project. Now we're working in behaviour. And over the past, uh, uh, I guess it's probably six or seven years, 
we've been collecting samples from Australian livestock herding dogs and in particular we've been looking at um, mainly the Australian working Kelpie to understand uh, what makes a good working Kelpie. And so with that, we've been um, phen phenotyping the dogs, so collecting information about their quality of work and their uh, differences in how often they bark or bite or how well they are in the paddock or whatever from the owners. And we've also been collecting DNA samples from those dogs. Unfortunately, the overlap between the two groups is not as high as we would like, but we're getting there. So the Australian Working Kelpie is a breed that was developed in the 1870s and it was founded from um, some Scottish collie dogs that were brought to Australia. Um, unlike many collie dogs, these dogs have short fur and uh, pricked ears. And it's thought that the reason they were able to get these uh, really good working dogs really cheap was that the pricked up ears in Scotland were a big problem with the snow and ice where the dogs would get frostbite. But in Australia, it's wonderful because it helps the dogs to dissipate the heat. Um, so the, the breed was pretty much founded on a couple of extremely good working dogs, one of which um, was a dog called Coyle who... Uh, competed in the first working sheepdog trials at the Sydney Royal Easter Show and uh, won its rounds on the first day but broke its leg overnight but still competed the second day, wouldn't let that happen now, with a broken leg and won it with a perfect score. So these are dogs that are really, really highly resilient and very, very valued in the Australian um, livestock uh, farming community. It's also rumoured they have a bit of dingo in them. We did a paper on that last year, which shows there's not really, if there was any, there's not much left, is the short answer, which upset a lot of people, I will say, because Australians are very, uh, we love our folklore, and um, I think a lot of people were disappointed. Anyhow, so we asked people to participate in an online questionnaire, or we have a paper version as well, or sometimes if people were struggling with the online one, we would have someone help them go through it but we were able to gather uh, lots of information on the dogs this way and we asked, you know, about 60 different questions about the way the dogs worked. And uh, of those 60 odd questions, 45 of them relate to working traits. And then we also asked things about, you know, how they were housed, how many dogs in the household, you know, did they live, are they kenneled outside or in the house? what working context they work in. And this is a really important one because people presume that livestock herding dogs are all the same, but they're really not. So livestock herding dogs have many different jobs and each of these has a very different um, skill set. So we have, uh, in Australia, we have yard dogs and you see the dog on the back of the sheep here. These dogs have to be very bold. They often like them to bark and maybe nip the sheep if the sheep are going a little bit slow. By contrast, the, you might have seen in the beer commercials the three sheep trials where they uh, have a dog that works three sheep through uh, a set of obstacles in a showground. But then last of all in Australia, most valued perhaps is what's called the paddock dog. And the paddock dog, um, there's a little video here but I won't show it, the sheep that you see in this picture at the beginning of the video are way over, about a kilometre away or so half a mile away over the back of that hill there. And with the paddock dog, what happens is the farmer will stand at the gate and he'll give his dog a command, you know, way back Scruffy. And Scruffy will run out, um, cover, you know, several square kilometres and bring these sheep back to the farmer who just stays standing at the gate. And in this one, the dog has to work entirely on its own and it has no, it has to work a good distance from the sheep, barking and biting really big no-nos. And you want a dog that's calm and patient and all the opposite things from the yard dog. So uh, we took these survey scores and we did correlations and what we found was that the dogs that had the overall best uh, working traits those tended to be correlated with dogs that also had good working skills and those were very negatively correlated. I apologise for the small text here. Those, were, those 
strong working traits were very negatively correlated with two in particular, which were fear ner and nervousness. And so we really don't want fearful dogs. That's the worst thing you can be if you're a livestock herding dog. You can't have a fearful dog. You need a dog that's confident to go out and work those sheep. So we could simplify those down where the things that were highly correlated with one another, we could gather those up into, into a group. And then we could use those for mapping and we mapped that. Um, and I'll just show you uh, one of the results here. After we corrected the data, we did a genome-wide association. So here we have markers and the higher up the peak goes, the more connected it is with the trait of interest. And uh, from these dogs, we were able to map the intelligence aspect of the dogs. And we were able to find a nice hit here that's not genome-wide significant yet, but it stands out from the rest in a nice way. And when we go into the literature, what we found was that this locus that we identified has been seen before in the literature. But in this case, uh, in the previous uh, literature, it was connected with obsessive compulsive disorder in uh, certain breeds of dogs. And so this, it, the boundaries of the region were precisely the same as this obsessive compulsive disorder locus. And so that made us ask, well, um, you know, whether our, our dogs that we thought were more intelligent were really more intelligent or if they're just more obsessed with sheep. So what we did was we checked that against the variants that had been identified in that paper that mapped obsessive compulsive disorder. And we found that um, those different those variants were different. So what we think is a different, like a balancing aspect of obsessive compulsive disorder is this better calm ability to uh, rationalize the situation, to work out what to do and to be a great livestock herding dog. So uh, in behavior genetics, it's very important that you test your survey data to check that it's doing what you think it is. And so we had a, a behaviorist go out and actually do some, um, do some checking of dogs that had both the survey done and then we ran a behavior uh, test uh, set on them and we found that there was a fairly good correlation there. So that sets us up well for being able to publish our data later. And so this is work that's ongoing, but there's lots of different behaviours there and it's going to keep me busy probably for the rest of my career. All right, so I'm starting to get a little bit short on time, but I'll just quickly, um, quickly, quickly go over the last one, which is mapping an eye disorder in greyhounds. And this is in collaboration with the greyhound working and racing veterinarians. Um, they're collecting samples for us. Greyhounds have an eye disorder called PANIS or super, chronic superficial keratitis and it has a very particular way that it affects the eye. It's, chronic, it's an ongoing condition. It's, not, it's treatable but it's not curable and it's quite a big welfare problem in the breed. Um, we did a bit of earlier, we have quite a lot of samples on hand um, to help us with this research. And we've done a little bit of uh, earlier work that has looked at how it's inherited through pedigrees in the breed, and that suggested that it was a dominant trait. So we've recently done a bit of mapping, and we've found two loci um, that are connected with this trait, one of which on chromosome 20 is a trait that's known to be connected with other autoimmune diseases. And um, the the second locus is uh, a known immune gene, but it's been quite difficult to assay because um, of the nature of the DNA in that area. So we're, that one's been a bit of a problem for us. So that's just a really quick snapshot of the work that we have underway in our lab. Um, and uh, I, I'm happy to take some questions from you. And just last of all, I just want to thank all of the people who have been helping us with our research from the Doberman Diversity Project, who've given, who have very generously um, given us access to all of their data. Embark for the invitation here today, the Greyhound Racing and Working Veterinarians and the AgriFutures and the Working Healthy Council for helping with the livestock work. So I'm sorry to have rushed the last bit, but I'm happy to accept some questions from you.
Yeah, so um, someone wants to know what should dog breeders take away from our work on genetic diversity? Um, I think that every breed is different. And I, my general view is that uh, there's a lot of scaremongering, if you like, around diversity in dogs. I think there's still plenty there to work with. Um, I think that every breed is going to have its own problematic regions of the DNA and knowing those could be really helpful. So for the Dobermans, in, for example, we can see that that chromosome 3 is a bit of an issue. In the breed that I have, uh, we have another chromosome that I think might be a bit of an issue because it's got a couple of disorders on it and so trying to juggle our way between the disorders is a bit problematic. Um, but really, I, the, the thing I would caution is diversity alone, diversity alone or heterozygosity alone, you do want it to be broadly, I, I guess the thing I would want to say is you want to look at the whole genome. You don't want to just like hone in on the MHC, for example, because that's one very small piece of the bigger picture. And you really want to know what's going on. You want to be sure that rare things are not rare for a reason. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that is, I think, more data. Each breed needs to do its own thing. Um, but generally I would uh, suggest to people that I am not a big fan of line breeding. Um, I think... There, but I think a lot of people uh, confuse line breeding and selection so that a lot of people who say they're line breeding are really using selection and selection is fine. You know, you want to capture good genes for good traits. So the speaker prior was talking about fronts on dogs. And so you don't want to lose everything you've built by just bringing in random genes here and there because you might in fact bring in one of these deleterious things that you weren't really looking for. So selection is good, um, but you can select and still outbreed. And so I would recommend people that are interested in improving their breed, use selection. But if you can find another dog that's not related to yours that has the traits you're after, go that way rather than using its, you know, close relative. All right, so in the interest of introducing genetic diversity, how can you trust an informally bred dog is a true member of the breed if no registering body has you can't is the answer <laughs> you can't well it depends on you as a breeder and what you value and if you value pedigree or if you uh, actually uh, value instead um, um, if, if you're not a member of a registry organization having a pedigree may not be so important to you you might be okay with going with the informally bred dog but um but uh, if you're in a pedigree, you're constrained. And you're con if you're in a pedigree organisation, you're constrained by the ethics of that organisation to breed from a dog that has a known pedigree. And But there's still lots of opportunity there. You saw on that Doberman plot, those dogs were very, you know, they, they're quite clustered. The German dogs all look German and the USA dogs all look from the USA. You can see they're quite different. You can see the dogs that are halfway in between. So there's plenty there to, to work with that will enable you to capture genes that are not already in your population. Um, so someone's asking, if more markers are best to understand diversity, why not whole genome sequence all of the dogs? Uh, because it's expensive and the expense isn't just in the sequencing, it's also in the analysis of the sequence data, the storage of the sequence data. You need people with specialist bioinformatics knowledge to understand that. I did have a great idea a few years ago that every sire that sires more than say, you know, a hundred progeny should have its whole genome sequence so we can see what's coming down the track, but no one seems to have picked that idea up yet. Um, so someone's here saying, would it make sense to use the visualization of re-diversity plot to select mates and select those that are furthest apart? Um, you can do that. Um, yeah, that's one way to do it. You can also do it using the pedigree. Just choose a dog that doesn't have the same ancestors as yours. But I think that you've got to, everybody's breeding goals are a little bit different. And my sense is that's why 
um, there's still a lot of diversity in pedigreed breeds, it's because while a lot of people claim that all people in the pedigree dog world are just breeding to the breed standard, in my experience of seeing what people breed and what the um, previous speaker was telling us, that's just not true. I mean, people breed the dogs they have in their yard and they try and find a way of making the progeny better by choosing a mate for that dog that kind of corrects some of the issues that that dog has. And everybody's breeding dog goal is different. You know, someone might like fronts, someone might like rears, someone might like heads, someone might like colour and marking, someone might like working temperament. So all of these different goals that breeders have and the emphasis is that they put them on them maintain more diversity in dog breeds than people expect. Okay, so since there are three distinct Kelpie jobs requiring specific behaviour, do you look for genetic differences between? Um, so there are differences between them. Uh, the yard dogs are very different in, different in terms of barking and biting than the other ones. Um, the trial dogs tend to be a bit more nervous. They tend to work more closely with their handler. So I guess being nervous isn't such a big problem for them as it is for a dog that has to work on its own out in the paddock or in the yard with a, a stroppy sheep who's going to stick its horns in the dog. So um, we know that there's a selective sweep for Kelpies on also on chromosome 3, strangely, uh, which was actually in uh, accidentally identified as a locus for a disease trait some years ago, which it's not, it turns out. Um, it was just selective sweep for... for resilient it actually is a a region that allows them not to um be so pain sensitive in their paws and so in australia lots of the paddock areas have lots of prickles and if the dog can't you know get out in the paddock and tread on the prickles and work the sheep he he can't work at all and so he will never be selected as a breeding dog so that uh, was that oh we're getting lots of questions all right based on Uh, so in the so the next question was relating to the same uh, region being related to both OCD and cognitive ability. Um, they were different variants. They were different haplotypes for both. So um, I think the region suggests that those are two sides of the same coin, but they're different processes. Probably they're different genetic makeups that make those there. Okay, so someone, um, I think that at this stage I wouldn't be taking home for a different breed the cognition uh, results. The, I, I wouldn't do anything until any of this is published, to be honest. It's still early days. They need to be published, and well, they need to be mapped to a statistical level that we are happy with as genetic geneticists and then they need to be validated before you start doing something with them in your breeding program. Um, so someone's asking about update on the relationship between, I think they mean MHC and autoimmune diseases and allergies. Um, I don't. I have to confess that the MHC is a reason, a region of the genome that I have studiously avoided in my career because it is highly... Uh, at a DNA level, it's very difficult to work with because it's very, very repetitive and it's very difficult to get things straight there. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that there's definitely a role in immunity, but I think, it, um, but there are other places in the genome that affect autoimmunity too. And the PANA situation is, is not point, the MHC in dogs is on chromosome 12. And I'm getting hits on chromosome 7 and 20. So you can tell that for that autoimmune immune trait, at least, the MHC has not is not playing a role, even though in previous literature they had suggested that it might be. Um, so how will using frozen and chilled semen affect diversity over time through genetic drift in breeds with small populations? So I think... What happens is uh, that eventually all populations will become one big population. So you'll go from having a breed like a Dandy Dinmont, for example, to having one that looks more genetically like on a diversity level, more like a Labrador or a Golden Retriever, where it's more akin to a large population size breed. 
So it just really what it does is it reduces that um, over time, over the long term, if there's lots of AI and importation of dogs, what ends up happening is that the global population becomes one population. Um, okay, so Spanish water dogs definitely possess the traits of the yard dog. Yes, uh, yes, yeah, so do um, uh, the lap hounds, I think. Do you have suggest oh, suggestions to reduce fearful gardeningness in a... Um, so I think that this is early work and I think in years to come there's the groups of us who are all interested in behaviour and hopefully we can get things together and start to make some headway there. But at the end of the day, every, every um, breed is different and uh, these are complex traits that will be influenced by many, many, many different genes in the genome. And so it's unlikely that we're going to have a one-size-fits-all for a genetic test. So there's one aggression test available now um, for Belgian shepherds, I believe, but I wouldn't be using that in a Spanish water dog. So, okay, is there a reference for the article on Panis? In Yes, um, it's in Animal Genetics. Um, it was just the based on the pedigree. We haven't published the DNA work yet. And in reference to panics being proposed as a simple dominant trait and our recent findings suggesting it's not, is it possible for a trait to be? Um, so what I think is that it might be um, two different genes can behave as dominant but be different ones in different lines. And so we were wondering, it may be that different, yeah, they're sort of the two of them add up but they look, in the data they looked dominant but the dna doesn't um it's not really supporting that at this point and i i want to say that a lot of people think that when scientists change their mind you know it means they're a bad scientist but actually <laughs> having a scientist that can change their mind is a good thing because you learn as you go you don't want to be so wedded to the view you have at the beginning that you can't change your mind you really need to learn from your experiences and from new data as it presents itself because what we really want is the truth that can help people. We don't want to just be dogmatic and stick to the views that we held and say, I'm, I'm the professor, I'm right, you shan't tell me I'm wrong. Um, we have to learn as we go and we have to accept that um, with new information, new truths emerge. So we just have to work with what we can. Um, I mentioned that genomics requires dense amount. What is dense enough? Um, well, I would say I can, I can actually make a... I can make an academic answer to this. So um, I know we know from the dog genome work that we did originally that um, the connectivity between markers in dogs extends for about a half of a million letters of DNA. So if we know, if we presume that among all dogs there's probably going to be a uh, say on average five or six different versions of uh, chromosomes that can be in that region, there's probably more actually, then you need enough markers to in that section to account for uh, the number of different versions that are there plus one. And so that will let you tell them all apart. And so that tells us that we need for each million bases of DNA we need probably about 12 or 15 markers. And um, there are two and a half thousand million letters of DNA. So we need two and a half thousand times 15, <laughs> which should be enough. <laughs> so that's how we work it out. And so I think 220,000 is probably pretty close to enough to do that job um but 30 is probably not enough because you need at least you know one per chromosome is not really going to get you there and um the bottom left of the scatter plot of the german working population is the oh so the i don't know if everyone can see the pictures in the chat but the they were showing the diversity plot i'll go back to it on the main screen da -da 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 -da. sorry i hope this doesn't take too long
I'll, I'll go through this to the front chart and um, actually I'll go to the this one because it tells you. All right, so I'll tell you who they are. These are the European show population. Oh, sorry, you can't can you can't see my arrow? I'm presuming the top left with the yellow dots is the European show population. The bottom left with the green dots are the German working population. The top right with the uh, sort of brown dots are the USA show population. The bottom right are the informally bred USA population. Um, there's an Australian population in the middle there somewhere and then the rest are kind of like interbred between those groups. So the dominant groups are the based, you know, probably because of the um, population sizes are the USA and the European populations. And, um, yeah, the working groups are quite distinct. And um, it, it might be an interesting mapping, actually, to show the working abilities. So you might see sweeps for the working dogs versus the the um, European show dogs. So, um, so the question is, how can the breeders best help our research program? Um, at this point, we need to have good questions to ask of the data. With de-identified data, we're a little bit limited in what we can ask. We can we can look at um, certain aspects of the data, but actually putting IDs uh, to that and phenotypes are very helpful. So if we can get those um, dogs identified, uh, that will help us to figure things out. But really, the first thing we need to know is what are the questions that you want answered? So we need good questions. The questions, how can, what do you want to do with your diversity? What is it that you want to find out? How, um, how can we leverage this to your benefit? What would you, what would be useful for you? So that is how you can help us is make good questions that we can help you answer. I think that's the last question. All right. Well, thank you again so much, Dr. Wade. Uh, you did an amazing job sharing about sophisticated topics in a really practical and easy to understand way. So I, I know our viewers all really appreciate it. Yeah. Sorry for the rush at the end, but hopefully it was interesting. It was a yeah. lot of fun too. Good, good. No, it, it was it was terrific. I mean, especially considering inbreeding and diversity are such crucial, crucial topics um, for breeders to understand. Um, I actually wanted to ask you one last question before you go, just sort of, a, you know, looking ahead over the next few years, you've you've talked about kind of looking backwards, all of the all of the things we've learned um, and all the things we know today. But as you look ahead, you know, are there any insights or discoveries you see on the horizon that you're most excited about? Uh, for me, the holy grail is figuring out um, what makes us tick behaviorally. I mean, this is something that can benefit all species. And um, I think that it would be wonderful to get a consortium of people together to look at it because I think it's really only by combining our resources that we're going to make a real headway there. Um, yeah, so I think every breed's different. Uh, the nice thing about dog breeds is because they are uh, closed populations that they help us to unravel the, the complex traits because it quietens down the background a bit. So it lets certain genes pop out more in population A. It may not be the same gene that's popping out in population B, but they're all part of the bigger picture. Right. That together we'll finally get to the answer. And, yeah, just understanding... Uh, just understanding why we behave the way we do or, yeah, I've got some ongoing projects at the moment um, that, yeah, I'm really, there's lots of exciting things ahead. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's terrific. And we certainly look forward to hearing about those things and um, continuing to apply the learnings as they're available. So 
So thank you again so much for being here. I know it's extra early in Australia right now. Oh, we, no, we not that extra early. It. It's really go to work time. <laughs> thanks a lot. And thanks for having me. All right. You're welcome.